these songs playing in the background, I uh, can't help but think about the lyrics of this uh, song. I was thinking about it uh, all the day long, the lyrics of Sweet Hour of Prayer that calls us from uh, a world of care and causes us to pause and reflect on what really matters. And uh, we're just so thankful to the Lord that uh, He is so merciful and uh, gracious to all of us that uh, we're able to be here tonight. So, with that being said, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. And let's get into the word tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it truly is a sweet hour of prayer that we might put away the things that so easily occupy our minds and cause us to lose focus on you. This hour of prayer that we have gathered together as a family to uplift each other, pray for one another, and to especially say your feet that we may hear a word from you. Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit to be in this place, but especially to be in our hearts and our minds. And lead us, Father, to a message that will cause us, Father, to further draw closer to you. Hide me behind your cross, O Lord. May Jesus be lifted up from the earth, that all men will be drawn unto you. May you speak now, Father, and forgive us of our sins, especially mine. Let me hinder you from listening or answering this prayer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I couldn't help but be in share some of the uh, prophetic insight that I've seen in the headlines. Have you been looking at the headlines? As Brother Aaron shared this one with me from the New York Times. The headline says, Markets are shaken by new signs of global economic trouble. Uh, just a few lines from this article from the New York Times says, the global economy is under increasing stress as growth cools and trade tensions take a mounting toll. On Wednesday, the tremors were felt worldwide. The financial jitters, which continued Thursday as markets in Asia were down in early trading came after new data showed the German economy hurtling toward a recession and factory output in China growing at its slowest pace in 17 years. The trouble in two of the world's manufacturing powerhouses indicated in part how hard both have been hit by Mr. Trump's tariffs and an increased concern that the United States too is headed for an economic reckoning. Goes on to say, the global backdrop has slowed more than anticipated, said Kathy Bostonik, chief United States financial economist at Oxford Economics. We're not immune to the slowdown. Bank of America Merrill Lynch has put the odds of a recession in the United States in the coming year at one in three, citing factors like weaker industrial production and auto sales. Are, are these uh, signs of these last days, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Go read to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And take a look at what the Bible says here, starting from verse 1. James chapter 5. Should we expect an economic crisis just before the close of probation, yes or no? James chapter 5, notice what it says here, starting in verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. Verse 1, the Bible says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and you will eat your flesh like fire, you have heaped up treasure when? In the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, 
and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. The Bible teaches us that there is going to be soon, very soon, an economic crisis that's coming ahead. And when I saw these headlines, I couldn't help but wonder. Another sign uh, drawing us closer and closer to the thought of Jesus coming soon. Another one, I was watching the headlines as well. It says, Brazil's Amazon rainforest is what? Burning. Burning at a record rate, research center says. Uh, notice what, this is August 22. Notice what it says, fires are raging at a record rate in Brazil's Amazon rainforest. And scientists warn that it could strike a what? A devastating blow to the fight against climate change. The Amazon is often referred to as the planet's lungs, producing 20% of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. It is considered vital in slowing global warming and it is home to uncountable species of fauna and flora. Roughly half the size of the United States, it is the largest rainforest on the, on the planet. Is this a sign? Yes. There's also an object lesson in this article that when it talks about how this is the Earth's lungs. What happens if you don't have your lungs? What happens? Yeah, you can't breathe. What is a symbol of breath in the scriptures? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. And the Lord Jesus breathed upon them. The holy breath equals the Holy Spirit. Are you following this, guys? And what we're looking at here is oxygen. You know that rainforest is very vital for us to breathe. You know that we're also told that the Spirit of the Lord is being what? Withdrawn from the, from the earth. So not only is it a sign in regards to what? The natural disasters that are happening, by the way, actually... This fire is said to be said, it was humanly started. Some human started it. I wonder who would want to burn down the earth's lungs. Maybe to hasten things to get it to where it needs to go. You understand what I'm saying? Who would want to go and burn down the lungs of the earth? Anyways, that's our prophetic update for tonight. Let's get into the message. Are you ready? Anybody know what this is? If you know what it is, it's the title of our message. No? This is known as the miracle fruit. Anybody, have you eaten, ever anybody eaten the miracle fruit? Do you know why it's called the miracle fruit? Because, it, uh, have you ever tasted some food that was nasty? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. Apparently, when you eat this, before you eat something that doesn't taste good, when after you eat this, it'll make your tongue believe that the food that you're eating that's nasty tastes good. Yeah. If you look it up, go home tonight, go home and look it up, what the miracle fruit is. It basically, that when you eat it, 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 and then you, the food that you don't think, like for example, let's say salad with no dressing. Is that nasty? <laughs> well, apparently if you eat this, yeah. Uh, one of the main things it says that's powerful is uh, lemon, that's sour. It says if you eat this, when you eat the lemon afterward, it'll taste like you're, you're eating a lemon, like you're drinking lemonade. You're like, mmm, after you eat the miracle fruit. Now there's an object lesson in that. <laughs> but nonetheless, the title of our message is what, everyone? Miracle fruit. Miracle fruit. fruit. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, miracle fruit. You want some miracle fruit? Yes or no? So that way, if, if somebody in your family that likes to cook, but you never want to tell them that it doesn't taste good, get some miracle fruit. That way you don't have to lie. Say, <laughs> mm, tastes so wonderful. All right, Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 to verse 7. If you're there, say amen. amen. Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. Familiar story to all of us. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, 
and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the... Isn't it amazing that the Bible clarifies things here? It says that when she conceived and born Cain, she said what? I have acquired a... Now, obviously, she would have looked at the little baby and said, this is a man, yes or no? You know, nowadays, what's happening? I don't know. Uh, let's let the baby decide what it is. If it's a man or a, or if it's a boy or a, or a girl. But the Bible is clear, yes? yes. That the, whatever biology you're born with, that's what you are. There's no in astro. But I wasn't a man that was born in a woman's body. I wasn't a woman that was born in a man's body. The Bible says she bore Cain. She looked at him and said, oh, I've got a man. A man. Notice it goes on here, it says, verse 3, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of what? Of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Also, Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your countenance what? Fallen. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should what? You should rule over it. So notice here that uh, the boys came and brought two offerings. One brought an offering. Cain brought what type of offering? Offering of the fruit of the ground. That's in verse 3. And what did Abel bring? The firstborn of his flock he brought as an offering. Abel's was accepted. Cain was not accepted. One was angry. The other one was, was not. Uh, uh, everyone following that? So as we're setting up our message up, as we're building the foundation of our message up tonight, I want you to pay attention to these things. The offerings that these two brought. One was fruit of the ground. The other one was the first born of the flock. Now, I'm going to put it in these terms. Are you ready? I'm going to put it in these terms. It means the same thing. And you're going to see that it means the same thing as our message goes on. But I'm going to put it in these terms. And then we're going to go through the rest of the message establishing why I'm naming it in these terms. Are you ready? The Bible puts it in this context. Fruit of the ground. First born of the flock. Both are offerings. One was accepted. One was, one was not. One was angry, one was was not. Are you following? I'm going to put in these terms. One gave an offering of fruit. The, the other one also gave an offering of fruit. Are you following? The lamb that he gave, or the first one that, that he gave, I'm going to call it a, I'm going to call it fruit. Is that okay? I mean, it should be okay for now until I prove to you why I'm calling it a fruit. Are you following that? Otherwise, you can't let me get away from calling it a fruit because I have not justified through Scripture why I'm calling it a... You can't just call it whatever you want. Are you following that? But I'm telling you right now to set up our message so you can follow me as we go along. One, both of them gave fruits. Literal fruit. Spiritual fruit. One was not accepted, the other one was accepted. Are you following so far? All right. So uh, as we're following those terms, I'm going to go ahead now and go through the rest of the message establishing why I'm calling this one a, a fruit. In the context of the title of our message, miracle. the miracle fruit. Amen? Amen. The miracle one? Fruit. The miracle fruit. One fruit was accepted, the other fruit was was not. Mark chapter 11. Let's go to Mark chapter 11. <clears throat> 
Mark chapter 11. We're going to start reading from verse 12. I know that says 20, but just to get some context, let's go back up to verse 12. Remember last week's message? We touched on the uh, fig tree a little bit. Remember? We established that the fig tree represented Israel. Remember that the leaves represented a form of godliness, but denying the power. In other words, it had no figs. It had no fruits. The leaves on the tree were supposed to indicate that it had fruits. But under investigation, Jesus went under that tree, looked at it and says, how come it has leaves, but it has no fruits? Because a fig tree, when it has leaves, it's supposed to have But this tree had leaves, but it had no fruit. And we established, remember last week, how we in the Odyssea can be this tree that has Leaves from afar we look like we're dedicated Christians, but under further investigation, closely looking at it, Jesus says they got no this tree has no fruits. And so therefore, cursing is this tree. Are you in Mark eleven? Yeah. Verse twelve says, Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a what? A fig tree having Leaves. He went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found what? Nothing Nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples what? Heard it. All right. Now that uh, we, we read those verses, we reviewed a little bit from last week. Now let's continue on. Verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the what? The fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has what? Has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be what? Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Keep going. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, notice this is, these verses are all related to this tree. Are you following so far? This tree is a tree that has leaves, but it has no fruits. In other words, it seems good, but it's not fruitful. I'm sure to Cain, it seemed that it was good. These fruits seemed that it was good, but God did not accept it. This tree that had leaves on it seemed like it was good, but under further investigation, it had no it had no fruits. So. This fig tree we talked about last week represented Israel, the Jewish nation of that time. We also talked about last week that this fig tree can represent who? It can represent who? It can represent us. A tree that has leaves, but no but no fruits. What happens? When Jesus is done with his investigation and he ends up finding out that we have no fruits, what happens? The tree becomes cursed, cut off. It can no longer produce fruit. It withers away. Are we living in the time of the investigative judgment? Right now, Jesus, what is he doing? He's investigating if there's any fruits. 
And if he doesn't find any fruits when probation closes for all of us, what happens? We become cursed and we wither. The disciples were fascinated when they saw this tree. And they said, wow, how fast it withered. Jesus. Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered away. What was Jesus' response? He answered and said to him, what? Now, can you imagine a fig tree up here? Just use your imagination. As you're looking at it, what do you see? We should all say, I see myself. We always try to look at it from a perspective that doesn't include ourselves. Remember, we just talked about for the past five minutes that this is Israel. This is the Jewish nation. So you were looking at the tree, and you're Peter, and you're looking at the tree. Wow, how fast it withered away. You cursed it, Lord. And pretend that we are all Peter. And we're looking at the tree, and it's like we're fascinated how quick it withered away, how cursed it was. And we should look at that and say, you know what, that's a picture of, that's a picture of me. That's a picture of my future if I don't bear fruits. Jesus says to Peter, have faith in God. Now if you, have, if you and I have faith in God, are we going to bear fruits? So what is Jesus saying to Peter as they're looking at the tree? Have faith in God. Translation, bear, bear fruits. Or this is our future. You understand what I'm saying? Do you know how we bear fruits, guys? Through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. This tree represents someone who rejected the Holy Spirit. Are you following this? Now watch this. It says, For surely they say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed or be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that these things he says will be done, he will what? He will have whatever he... So what is Jesus saying here? He says, if you see this mountain, he says, if this mountain, if you pray, whoever says this mountain, be removed and be cast into the... Now what does this mountain represent, guys? What does this mountain represent? Now remember, in context, we're still talking about the tree. So now he's using what this is called parallelism. Parallelism is, he's talking about the tree, but now he's using different... Analogy. He's now using a what? A mountain. He says, that mountain, if you say to a cast, go jump into the sea, what happened? Whoever says that not be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, which means he has faith, what happens? Believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he... See, Jesus is trying to explain how he cursed that tree. Are you following that, guys? In other words, there are many examples in Scripture where Jesus is saying everything he's doing is from the power that the Father has given him to do. He's not using his godly powers. Are you following this? Because we don't have godly powers of our own. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit to do something like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So Jesus is demonstrating here that the Father, because I have faith, I'm able to do this. I'm able to, to curse this tree. I'm able to do all these things. Are you following? Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So this explains the power of Jesus. When he's able to say, come out of her evil spirit. When he's able to say, go home. Your faith has made you whole. He's explaining to us that because he has Faith, because he's a tree that has fruits, whatever he says, which is according to the word, which is according to his father, because he did not come to speak his own, when he, whatever he, it will come to pass, because God's word is not false. Amen. Let man be a liar and God be true. His word is true. So what is he? So what are we learning here? Here's what we're learning. What we're learning is, is that Jesus has the power to curse the tree. Yes or no? 
But does he also have the power to take a bad tree and make it good? Yes or no? Yes. Here's another question. Can he take a dead tree and cause it to produce fruit? Yes or no? Yes. If a dead tree, like a bisphic tree, was able to produce fruit, what would you call it? I would call it a miracle fruit. Because why? Because dead trees are not supposed to be able to what? Bear fruit. So if it bears fruit, it's a miracle. Here's a lesson, guys. Humanly speaking, as human beings, we cannot bear good fruit in and of ourselves. That's what the Bible teaches. Because we are this, at our best, guys, at our best, we are a tree with leaves. That's it. Our righteousness are as a tree with just leaves. That's the best we can come up with. But is that acceptable to God? No. No. So how do you take an unacceptable tree with no fruits and make it a tree that bears fruits and God accepts it? How? It takes a Miracle. Did you know that you and I, to produce the character of Christ, it's going to take a miracle. And there's only one person that I know of that can give a miracle. And that's the God who Yes or no? Yes. To take, now let's put it this way, to take a sinner and make him into a saint. It's going to take a, a miracle. You understand? No matter how much time we spend doing all of our external works for the Lord, it all will amount, no matter how much, if you do it every second of every day of your life, it will only amount to a tree with leaves and no fruit. But a person in which the Spirit works them will cause a tree to bear fruits that it's not supposed to bear fruits. Are you following that? Amen. Notice here in the Songs of Solomon. Songs of Solomon, not many people preach on this book because it's kind of uncomfortable. It has relational language between uh, what the book is called The Beloved and the Shulamite Woman. This is a picture of Christ and his bride, his church. Notice in Songs of Solomon it says, I am the rose of and the lily of the who's that? You know the song, lily of the the rose of Sharon is Jesus himself and who's the Shulamite? That's the woman, that's the, that's the church, that's the bride of Christ and he speaks about it. The fig tree puts forth her and the vines with the tender give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He is speaking about her. Referring to her as if referring to her as a fig tree who puts forth her green figs. Are you following this? Hosea 9, 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the on the fig tree in its first season but they went to Baal Priyar and separated themselves to that shame they became an abomination like that thing they further evidence that a fig tree can be representative of God's people God's bride, his church but notice Matthew 7, 17 and 20 this is familiar to us it says even so every good tree what does it do? But a bad tree. bears what? Bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the 
fire. Therefore, by their fruits, what? You will know them. Now, let me ask you a question. At the end of the day, when the time of the investigative judgment is over, will everyone bear fruits? When probation is closed, has everyone bore fruits? In, in, the, in the context of this passage, everyone will bear fruits. It's just some will be good fruits, some will be, but both are, are fruits. Remember how we started with the story and I labeled uh, Abel's as fruits? Fruit, both are fruits. Are you understanding why I'm calling them both fruits? I'm using the scripture, are you following? So everyone will bear fruits. But some will bear good fruits, some will bear bad fruits. Now an analogy of the fig tree, the bad fruits, is represented as no fruits. Are you following? No fruits, bad fruits, same thing. Are we together? Alright, so notice here uh, that a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears... So who is the good tree? Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 19? He says what? There is no one that is good, but but God. So who's the good tree? God. Are you following that? God is the good tree. Who's the bad tree? Humanity is the bad tree. Our nature will produce bad fruit. Everyone following so far? So the key is, how do you make a become a are you following? Isn't that a beautiful thing about the gospel? That a bad tree can become a good tree. How do you take a fig tree that has a bunch of leaves and no fruit? How, it's already grown. Are you following? How do you make that thing grow fruits? How do you, do you take a needle and shoot the roots and Hoping for something good. The only way that that thing can grow fruit is what? A miracle. Are you following? Notice this says in Matthew 12, 32 to 35. Either make the tree good. and its fruit good. or else what? And it's for a tree is known by its fruit. So, how is a... How, Based on that line, how do you take a bad tree and make it a good tree? Either make the tree good and its fruit, or else what? And it's... So, both are made. Are you following? Yes, we are born with this tendency our nature is of a bad tree. Are you following? But as we grow and we start to make decisions, we make our tree, or we make our tree, we make our, our fruits, or we make our fruits. Are you following, guys? So how do we make a bad tree good tree? Well, number one, it's going to take a miracle. And number two, the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Is it, God is the only one that can provide that, that miracle. Yes or no? Yes. It's kind of like taking a barren woman who cannot have, give birth and having her have a... Yeah. Did that happen? Yes. Did it happen several times? Yes. How did that happen? A miracle. A miracle. Through who? Through the God, yes, through the Holy Spirit. Are you following? If God can put a seed into a tree that cannot bear fruit, in other words, if God can take a seed and put it into a woman that cannot bear a child, can he not put something into a tree that can cause it to bear fruit? Can he not put something in a person to cause him to be one ugly person inside to be one righteous person in Jesus. Yes or no? It will take a miracle. Know that song? It takes a miracle. You heard that song? 
Notice he goes on to say, Brood of vipers, how can you be speak what? Isn't that a question that we were asking? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, a good man out of the of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of brings forth evil. So where does the bad fruit bad fruit come from and where does the good fruit come from? The good fruit comes from the good treasure. The bad fruit comes from the evil treasure. Wait, this was the good side, right? I'm going to be consistent. This is the bad side. Bad fruit, evil fruit, good fruit, good treasure, evil treasure. Alright. So what is the good treasure and what is the evil treasure that ends up in men's hearts that causes them to be what one tree versus another tree having fruit or no fruit or having good fruit and having bad fruit. What's the good treasure? What's the evil treasure? Matthew 6 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your now you have to ask yourself as I ask myself, what kind of treasure do you have in your heart? Is it a good treasure? Or is it evil treasure? Now, what are we most likely susceptible to? Evil treasure. But the good news of of what we're learning is that the evil treasure can be replaced by the good treasure, which then comes forth out and produces. Yeah? Because either make the tree good or make the tree evil. Are you following? So how do the treasure? Well, how did the treasure get there? Well, where your treasure is is where your heart is. So whatever treasure you have inside of you, whatever treasure I have inside of me, this treasure determines the output. Right? What goes in is what comes what comes out. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4 says, For even if our gospel is what, everyone? Veiled. It is veiled to those who are, whose minds the God of this age has, who do not believe, lest the light of the, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on. But we have, in what? What's the treasure? The gospel. Notice it says in Matthew 13, 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a... So what's the good treasure? It's the gospel. It is the kingdom of of heaven. This is the good treasure. Notice this Proverbs 15, 16, better is a little with the fear of the... than great treasure with... So is he that layeth up treasure for him and is not rich toward what? Toward God. We read this earlier, James 5, 1 to 3. Come now, ye rich, weep and how, weep and how, for your miseries that are coming upon you, your riches are, and your garments are moth, your gold and silver are, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and you will eat your flesh like you have heaped up in what? So what's the evil treasure? What's the good treasure? The gospel or the kingdom of? What's the evil treasure? It's treasure with trouble. It's treasure for your or selfishness. Or what? Where is it? Riches with gold and this, right? Well, the, the love of money is the root of all trees that have leaves and no fruit. You understand what I'm saying? So there's good treasure. Remember what Jesus told the rich young ruler? Go sell all your things. Come follow me and you'll have treasure in the kingdom of God. So there's the good treasure. What's this? this There's the good treasure. And there's the bad treasure. What kind of treasure... 
do you have in your heart? What kind of treasure do I have in my heart? Because that treasure makes the tree either good or bad. Are you follow? Now the good treasure is the gospel. And the gospel is what causes the miracle fruit to come forth. You understand? The evil treasure is money. And basically money Here is dependent on God. Here the rich man depends on his own money. It depends on his own strength. He gets everything he wants through money. This guy gets everything he wants through faith. What did Jesus say? Whatever you ask, if you believe, you shall you shall receive it. This guy say, whatever you want, my black card, charge it. Anything you want, you can have it. You understand what I'm saying? But one is unto eternal salvation. The other one will soon become cankered and they will throw it away. It will become worthless. This is as, as good as a tree is with leaves and no fruit. Uh, are we following guys? So what's the point of all this? Where is Jesus in all of this? The tree, let's go back to the tree with just leaves. Is it a living tree or is it a dead tree? Remember, Jesus looks at it, it has no fruits. If you have no fruits, you're dead. Do you understand? It may appear that it's living, but it's actually, it's dead. Are you following? So, Jesus basically, when he cursed it, he did something that showed an outer manifestation of what was already inside the tree. It's no good. What good is a tree if it bears no, especially if it's a fig tree? If you're an apple tree, what good are you if you don't produce apples? You understand what I'm saying? So, it's a dead tree. Yes or no? Jesus is in the business, and I'm wrapping it up now. Jesus is in the business of taking dead trees and causing a miracle. I would say Jesus is in the business of taking dead trees, replanting them, and causing them to bear fruit. Are you a tree tonight? I know I am. Are you a tree tonight that recognizes you are this dead tree and you need Jesus to replant you to bring fruits out of you? You need him to come into you to produce that miracle fruit. Do you, are you recognizing that? Yes or no? Once upon a time, Jesus carried a dead tree. Do you understand what I'm saying? Once upon a time, he carried a dead tree. That dead tree he was carrying had no fruits. He had to take that tree that was dead. It had no fruits. And he took it on top of a hill and he plants it, so to speak. Then he hangs on with it. That tree that he's carrying is not supposed to be able to bear fruits. But he became the fruit to a dead tree. Do you know uh, the Bible tells us here, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. Who have been upheld by me from birth? 
who have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he. And even to the gray hairs, what does it say? I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Did he bear it? Even I will carry and what? And will deliver you. He put that thing on top of a hill. You know what Jesus said about us? He said that you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be what? A tree. A dead tree. You and me. We have no business bearing fruit. But he carried us to the top of the hill. Plexus becomes one with us. And you know when Jesus is on the cross, it's a form of judgment. You know that, right? God looked down and investigated that tree, representing you and does it have fruit? Does it have fruit? It's Christ Himself who hangs for that tree. And he says, That's the tree that I'm looking for. He set us so we can shine. What's shining from us? What's so beautiful about this tree that's on the hill. It's the fruit of Jesus Christ who had. Says here, a city that's set on the hill cannot be hidden. Also he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a for there is nothing hidden which will not be nor has anything been kept secret but that it should come to you know, those are words regarding judgment. You understand that? The cross not only represented love, not only represented grace and the mercy of God, but it also represented the judgment of God. Remember how the Bible says, who shall be able to stand? Only those who have that fruit. We have no business being a tree on top of a hill. But he took us and he carried us and he put us on top of a Hill. You are the light of the a city that's set up on a hill. You shall bear fruit. The miracle fruit. And if you eat of this miracle fruit, everything in this word will taste better. Amen. Sometimes we read the word, I don't like the way it tastes. The reason why you don't like the way it tastes is because you haven't eaten the miracle fruit, the cross of Jesus, that makes everything so sweet Amen. to eat, like a honeycomb. Amen. Final point here, there were two men crucified, one on his right and one on his Notice what the Spirit of Prophecy says. To Jesus in his agony on the cross there came one gleam of it was the prayer of the penitent thief. Both the men who were crucified with Jesus had at first, had at first railed upon him and one under his suffering only became more desperate and defiant. But not so with his this man was not a hardened criminal. He had been led astray by evil association, but he was less guilty than many of those who stood beside the cross reviling the Savior. He had seen and heard Jesus and had been convicted by his teaching, but he had been turned away from him by the priests and rulers. Seeking to stifle conviction, he had plunged deeper and deeper into sin until he was arrested, tried as a criminal, and condemned to die on the cross. In the judgment hall and on the way to Calvary, he had been in company with Jesus. He had heard Pilate declare, I find no fault in him. He had marked his God-like bearing and his pitying forgiveness of his tormentors. On the cross, he sees the many great religionists shoot out the tongue with scorn and ridicule the Lord Jesus. He sees the wagging 
heads. He hears the upbraiding speeches taken up by his companion in guilt. If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Among the passers-by, he hears many defending Jesus. He hears them repeat his words and tell of his works. The conviction comes back to him that this is the Christ. Turning to his fellow criminal, he says, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? The dying thieves have no longer anything to fear from men. But upon one of them presses the conviction that there is a God to a future to cause him to what is that few guys what is he referring to here a future that's causing him to tremble what is he thinking about he's talking he's thinking about the judgment of God will you have fruits or will you not will you be like Cain or will you be like Abel in this context will you be the thief that decided to believe and bear fruits unto God. Or you become like this thief who decided to continue angry in rebellion. Amen. One was accepted, the other one was not accepted. Are you following this? Amen. Dropping it up here, and now all sin polluted as it is, his life history is about to, and we indeed justly he moans, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. With amazement, the angels beheld the infinite love of Jesus, who, suffering the most intense agony of mind and body, thought only of others and encouraged the penitent soul to believe. In his humiliation, he, as a prophet, had addressed the daughters of Jerusalem as a... And he had pleaded with the Father to forgive his... What does that sound like to you? He was a priest and an advocate. He had pleaded with the Father to forgive his... What does that sound like to you? A priest and an advocate pleading with the Father, forgive my murderers. Doesn't that sound to you like the investigative judgment? What's going on right now? There's a judgment going on. Judgment is upon Christ. There are two who profess Jesus. One tree, another tree. But one had fruit of Jesus. And what Jesus said to him, I say unto thee today, you shall be with me in paradise. The other one, lost. Lost. In his humiliation, he was a prophet, had addressed the daughters of Jerusalem. As priest and advocate, he had pleaded with the Father to forgive his. As a loving Savior, he had forgiven the sins of the penitent thief. One thief was accepted, the other was, both were thieves. Both brought offerings. One was accepted, one was not. We are all trees. The question is, for me and for you, is, what kind of tree are you? And if you recognize, as I do, that this tree we've been looking at all night, is you and me. There is hope because Jesus comes. Amen. And he wants to carry you. He wants to replant you and become that fruit that hangs from that tree. Won't you allow him to do that today? Amen. Won't you allow him to do that today? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. There's no enough words. We are dead trees. We have no business bearing fruit. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not wither away, should not be cursed, but have everlasting life, but have the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
May we live our lives in gratitude to this wonderful truth tonight. Thank you for the miracle fruit. May we eat of him daily, every morning, that your word may become sweet and sweeter. Preparing us, dear Lord, in this time of judgment, that when the time comes for the judgment to come upon the living, O oh Lord, may we be a city set on a hill, bearing the fruit of Christ, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As uh, we brought our service uh, to a close, let's uh, rise for our closing hymn, and then I'll close one more time with a word of prayer. And this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>